Hi, my name is Alexey Konashevich, and today we will talk about legal governance on blockchain. In one of my previous videos, I discussed what impedes the use of blockchain in legal applications. Some people believe that the immutability of the ledger and the impossibility of retroactive transactions make blockchain inapplicable for managing valuable assets, running serious smart contracts, and, and so on. And like I said before, it's a fallacy based on a lack of knowledge and understanding of this technology. So how to design legal applications on blockchain and how to avoid dead-end situations when a user loses the private key or sends asset to wrong address or when parties have dispute over a transaction or a smart contract or even if someone steals a crypto asset. First of all, let's us draw the line in which cases you can really do nothing about it. These complications are irrelevant only in one case, when you deal with a native blockchain token, or better to say, with cryptocurrency. As I explained in this video, cryptocurrency is crucial for developing all applications, tokens, smart contracts, dApps, and so on. But dead-end situations are possible with cryptocurrency. And there is nothing we can do with it. We just need to accept it. That's it. So we no longer discuss it. In all other situations, specifically saying when you deal with user-created tokens on the blockchain, it is a matter of a proper design of the application. Or other words, if you encounter one of the mentioned complications, it just means that you deal with a poorly designed application. And in this video, we'll learn how to create blockchain jurisdictions. So let's talk through a situation that would be speculatively illustrated to show the flaws of the blockchain. Say Alice owns tokens and she loses her private key. As we remember, a token is attached to an address that represents the user public key. So to unlock the asset, meaning to commit a transaction with it, you need a relevant private key. There is no other way to get access to it. You cannot hack it. There is strong cryptography behind it. If Alice lost her key or even died and left no key to anyone, so that's it. If Alice tries to reissue a new token saying that the old token represents no value, she can end up having duplicate tokens that will create legal confusion. Because what if Alice suddenly finds that key, or someone finds it? Then the network will have two tokens that supposedly represent the same value. No, this won't work. As an alternative, some people refer to a solution with a multi-signature scheme. Unfortunately, it's not a sustainable solution as well. Why? Okay, say Alice creates a scheme, two of three signatures needed to unlock her asset. Bob and Dave get their private keys. If two of three keys become inaccessible, for example, Alice and Bob die, or simply lose their keys, Dave, left alone, cannot unlock the asset. He needs at least one more key. Okay, she can create two of ten keys scheme. Of course, now the chances that at least two keys will survive are much higher, but the possibility of losing all keys still exists. And there is an increased chance that the asset will be stolen from Alice as a result of conspiracy of any two key keepers. Well, you can say Alice needs a trustworthy key keeper. For instance, a custodial company with high standards of work. But what if they go bankrupt or just disappear, as it happens with, with many crypto scams that pretend to be reliable? Surely it can be a very credible company, but then users will pay such high premiums that it won't be affordable and scalable for mass use. Besides, we often see that even the largest companies in the world are regularly hacked. It happened with Facebook, with Twitter, with Amazon, you name it. 
And finally, the problem of these cases is that once it gets to a dead end, it's dead end. There is nothing you can do with it. It's blockchain. Even if you go to the police and court, no judicial decision can be enforced in such a design of the system. Even if a person was found guilty, what can you do with tokens? He can say, I don't know where the private key is. I lost it. We need a sustainable solution that will work for a lifetime. There are examples in the real world when families own property for centuries because there are laws that protect private property and public institutions that make the system work. The land registry cannot go bankrupt and the court cannot disappear. Political turmoil can surely happen, but here you can do nothing with blockchain or without blockchain. And it's not even a, a topic of this discussion. And eventually, blockchain skeptics end up talking about permissioned blockchain. Well, first of all, there cannot be permissioned or private blockchain, as blockchain is a definition of an open, competitive, distributed, decentralized system. Permission DLT is a better name for this class of technology. It's centralized. And in this video, I explained the idea that permission DLT is the solution is at least self-deception. Because private or permissioned system where the ledger is sort of immutable only when we need to and we want to undermines the credibility of the system and undermines the whole idea of blockchain. If you can rewrite the ledger, you end up having just yet another centralized system in which the ledger is trustworthy to the extent to which the cartel that controls it is trustworthy. I doubt that it's even an alternative to any existing centralized property registry. So, is there any solution at all? Yes, I call it jurisdiction as a filter. First of all, we need to distinguish between uh, levels of interaction or consensus, if you wish. The first one is blockchain consensus. And the second is legal governance or social consensus. There is a misconception to think that legal governance must be designed somewhere within the blockchain protocol. No, blockchain protocol is the synchronization of independent nodes of a decentralized network. And it has nothing to do with the legal status of transactions. At this level, transactions happen and then live in this immutable database with no legal interpretation. Blockchain consensus protocol, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake or other variations, is only a mathematical protocol which task is to make sure the same copy of the ledger is distributed across the network and there will be no double spending with cryptocurrency. It ensures the consistency of blockchain, which in fact is a kind of database. But then we design legal governance, which is a layer above, and we are not trying to change anything in the blockchain if legal circumstances change. Instead, applications must be designed so users can attach new transactions that amend or otherwise change legal relationships when needed. So when Bob stole the token from Alice, we didn't need to, to take it back. In fact, it was impossible. Instead, we need to create another record on blockchain that says that this token is invalid. At this moment appears what I call a jurisdiction on blockchain, as we need a community and rules according to which the community exists. Their social consensus empowers legal governance. So after Bob stole the token, Judge Dave publishes a new record that states that this token is invalid. At the level of blockchain, Bob can still own it, 
and even commit a transaction with it. But because of the social consensus in our community, these token is just an invalid asset that has no value and hence no one wants to buy it. If it was a typical paper deal, would you buy a house if Bob came to you with a certificate of ownership of the title, but the record on the land registry says that it's invalid? Of course not. Therefore, jurisdiction is a convention. It's a set of rules that do not change the transaction on blockchain, but legally interpret them. Blockchain is immutable. A logical layer above creates knowledge about the legal status of transactions according to the rules that such a community establishes. Different communities can have their own rules, which they develop and empower through the uh, public authorities by virtue of their social contract. It turns out that jurisdiction is a filter of transactions that are superimposed on top of the blockchain. Different communities can use the same blockchain because it's just a public repository. Anyone can publish scam or spam there, and there is no censorship there. The community does not need censorship on the blockchain. They just don't pay attention to what is irrelevant. Two different communities on the same blockchain can have their own rules and their transactions won't even intersect. And what's interesting is that they can even apply different rules to the same transactions as interpretation is conventional and valid only within these jurisdictions. I don't find much practical sense in creating conflicting interpretations though, because if Bob comes to another community where the theft is not against the law and hence his, his token is valid, it still makes no sense because when Bob sells it to Eve in such a jurisdiction, Eve won't get any value from it as Alice still lives on this land within her jurisdiction. So you see, we don't need retroactive transactions or somehow change the history of blockchain. Blockchain is just our next generation technological environment in which we run applications. It is an immutable data repository, reliable storage of evidence, everything that happens in the real world, good or bad, legal or illegal, valid or invalid, everything is stored there. Blockchain the consensus doesn't deal with legal status. Its task is to supply impartial facts of what happened in the real world. If Bob commits a crime, we don't erase this fact it happened. But what if Dave, the authorities, got corrupt? If Dave starts to abuse his power making misappropriations, we need a new social agreement that removes his authority, filters out his unlawful transactions, and re-establishes deprived rights tokens. And the advantage of the blockchain is that even if we need to reset the whole system, from scratch and re-establish a new social agreement, no transactions will be lost. We will just roll out new filters, new rules to the same blockchain, good old mutable blockchain. I call it protection from digital dictatorship. The ministry of truth that wipes out unwanted history won't be possible as blockchain is incorruptible. That's it for today. So you have learned a high level concept of building jurisdictions on blockchain. In the next videos, we will dive into technical protocols and architecture solutions for legal applications. See you. But what if Dave, the authorities, got corrupt? If Dave starts to abuse his power, making misappropriation if Dave starts to...
If Dave starts to abuse his power, making misappropriation, 